Welcome to my presentation, The Contribution of Cognitive Engagement in Eliciting Self-Understanding and Autographic, Autoethnographic Poetry Writing. My name is David Hanor and I'm a Professor of Applied Linguistics at Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And this is my presentation for EGLE 2023. So let me start just by outlining my research agenda so that you have a sense of the context within which this work was actually done. So I've been interested for at least uh, 10 or 12 years in the concept of meaningful literacy. And meaningful literacy is a series of creative writing practices which can be used in the composition classroom or, or second language classroom. And what characterizes them is that they facilitate a personally meaningful interaction and lead to one understanding one's own experiences in the world. If you're interested in following up on this, you might take a look at my book from 2012, uh, 2010, uh, entitled uh, Poetry as Research. Now, the particular practice that I'm interested in and spent a very long time developing is poetic autoethnography. And this is where you use poetic writing as one of the ways of both expressing and understanding one's own experience. Um, and there's quite a lot of primarily um, anecdotal evidence that following through with a poetic autoethnography does indeed lead to a situation of self-understanding. However, one needs to ask the question, particularly if you were working within a psycholinguistic or an empirical literary context, how does self-discovery occur during the process of poetic autoethnography? And that's work that I've been involved with for quite a while now. So let's talk about the process of writing poetry. And let me give a very quick summary of about 20 years of research um, on this issue. But I think we are now in a good place in understanding. And on this slide, you have uh, visualizations from a neurolinguistic study done by Lou et al, which show brain functioning. You also have some qualitative data, some document data, which was represented here. And all of these different pieces of data go into, and, and there's quite a lot of agreement between them, that the process of writing poetry basically involves two types of stage that are recursive between them. There is a generation stage, which involves language play, free association, wandering thoughts. And then there is a quite extensive revision stage where you have deliberative thinking, aesthetic judgments, user pedagogy features, and so on. And this is recursive, you move between these two. And the outcome of this, as I argue in my book, is that there is a process of self-discovery. There is also a body of literature on discovery in the writing process, not necessarily about poetry, but we should relate to it. The, the classic work in this field, uh, Flower and Hayes, 1980, uh, very old process model, however, still uh, very uh, powerful as a theoretical concept, even to this day. They basically assume that discovery only happens in the transformation where knowledge is transformed. Uh, so activated memories don't do anything. Knowledge of rhetorical situation doesn't do anything. But when you apply strategic problem solving to solve the rhetorical situation, new understandings emerge from your writing. A more developed and more current theory from Galbraith and Baijin proposes that there are two, it's called the due process model, there are two processes which lead to discovery. There's a knowledge constituting process, which is fast, effortless, not demanding much working memory, and involves the generation of text from implicit episodic memory. So the free writing type of thing where data just comes out. And that process, according to Galbraith and Baijin, leads to uh, some level of discovery. There is also the knowledge transforming process. This is what Flower and Hayes were describing. So it's slow, effortful, control, demanding of working memory. And through the evaluation and manipulation of ideas and texts, you 
achieve a level of understanding in relation to what you have written. Now, when we apply this to the model of poetry writing, we can see that there's, once again, quite a lot of overlap. Poetry generation stage is basically very close to the knowledge constituting uh, a discovery process, very free, fast synthesis, uh, associative sort of writing. And then the revision stage is very close to the knowledge transforming discovery process, evaluation, reflection, reorganization, slow, controlled, reflective engagement with text. And both of these are supposed to lead to an outcome in which you have uh, knowledge, uh, you have discovery. Now, um, that's the hypothesis that both of these lead to discovery, but we actually have some data on this from two prior studies that I've done, and I'd like to present the res results from them. So this is data actually I presented last year at Eagle at this conference, and I think it's worth going over here very quickly. Um, not everybody remembers my presentation, and not everybody was there, I'm sure. Okay, so in order to look at um, the process of discovery, I divided it up into two levels, emotional clarity, so that's an emotional level of understanding, and insight, which is a cognitive level of understanding. And then I compared between the elicitation stage and the revision stages, and the elicitation stage and the revision stages. And what we can see here is something very simple. First off, we can see that both for emotional clarity and for insight, during the elicitation stage, we have very high levels of uh, elicitation, a very high level of, of rating for both emotional, uh, emotional clarity and insight. But we also see that when we get to the generative, uh, the revision process, there is a, a very significant drop. And you can see that these drops are significant. And the conclusion we can reach from this is that experience elicitation does lead to discovery. However, the revision stage, the second stage, the cognitively engaged stage, actually reduces the level of uh, discovery. This is the second study that I did also last year, and this was presented um, um, published in the Journal of uh, Frontiers, written communica Frontiers in Communication Studies. And what I did here, which I think is interesting, is I looked at two different types of genre, poetry writing and free writing. What characterizes free writing is a double process of discovery writing, right? Free writing, generative process. So you have a generative process one and you have a generative process two. And what's interesting about the results that we found here is that there is an interaction between the two genres. For the poetry writing, we see the same, more or less the same phenomenon we saw before in relation to emotional clarity, high initial levels, and then it basically stays flat or even goes down a little bit. And for insight, high initial levels that do go down. But for the poetry writing, which you remember has two stages of generative writing rather than generative and revision, you see you have an increase. So a double dose of generative writing leads to an increase in emotional clarity and an increase in insight. So we have quite strong evidence for the role of generative writing, free writing, that type of work, the poetry elicitation initial stage, that that leads to discovery. But we do not have yet any data that the revision stage actually leads to um, um, discovery. And this raises a particular question. So why does the revision stage not increase self-discovery? And that's actually what this lecture is about. So we have three different types of hypotheses that we can be, can be proposed. There might be some more, but these are the three that I've been thinking about. The first is the destabilizing hypothesis. I presented it last year at Eagle. And the idea is basically this, that the first telling of anything is a sort of rehearsed narrative, very quick narrative. Um, and when you actually think about it in the revision stage, what you think you knew about it actually goes down. So it's destabilizing. That's why you have a significant drop. 
I'm not going to be checking that today. However, it is on my research agenda and I have a design for this study and perhaps next year I'll present it if I do the work, of course. The second proposal is the length of exposure. Perhaps, you know, revision is a long process. Poetry revision might take three weeks or a month. I'm giving a few minutes for, for uh, revision. Perhaps the length of time is just not long enough for this to actually be meaningful. And the third hypothesis, and that's a hypothesis I'm going to focus on here in this lecture, is the relative effort hypothesis. Perhaps the students got tired. They just didn't do very much in the revision process. And if you don't really, if you're not really cognitively engaged in the revision process, perhaps you're not really doing the revision, in which case you would expect a drop. In other words, there's an effect here of just the quality of the work that was done during the revision, which didn't reflect actual processes, just sort of um, not doing it in, in a survey framework. So let me elaborate on the relative effort, effort hypothesis. And first, let me just say, how do we know if we have cognitive engagement? Well, I'm going to propose a very simple uh, set of criteria. One, if you have cognitive engagement, you're going to have high quality writing. In other words, the quality of what you produce is going to be better. The quality of the revision is going to be better. The quality of the output, in this case, a poetic image, is going to be better. And the second one is usually we think of cognitive engagement as a longer processing time. You spend more time on it, basically. So I have a general question. Are there differences in the degree of insight and emotional clarity for participants who have different levels of cognitive engagement during the revision phase of poetry writing? And more specifically, are there differences in the degree degree of insight and emotional clarity for participants who produced high levels of poetic image, in other words, high quality writing, and is there a relationship between the length of revision time and the degree of insight and emotional clarity specified by participants? Mm -hmm. Let's talk about the method. Okay, so I decided not to use university students, not composition students, which I have used quite extensively in other uh, studies, and just to go for a general population, therefore I used Amazon Turk and paid each participant one dollar. I limited it to first language English writers, mainly because I didn't want to deal with the complexities of second language poetry writing. I have 60 participants. I actually had 455 responses and all responses, as you do with Amazon Turk, have to be monitored for actual completion of the task. It's unfortunate that my data collection coincided with the emergence of AI, ChatGBT, because quite a lot of responses were obviously not written by human beings, but by computers. And I might add as an aside, if you want to know if ChatGBT is doing your work, give them a process which involves a reaction to a previous set of writing that you've done, and you'll see that ChatGPT just produces garbage. Um, I have 34 males, 26 females, age was from 18 to 65, the mean age was 28.3, 56 employed, three unemployed, one retired, the majority had college levels of education, 54 and 6 were, were high school level education, and 27 states were represented. Okay, so how did I operationalize the old ethnographic poetry writing? I divided it up into two stages. There's a generation stage, and I'll show you the prompt in a second, and then an image generation and poetry revision stages. This is the prompt for uh, experience elicitation. If you're really interested in it, please stop the video and just read it. I'm going to go uh, forward to the next prompt. This is the image generation prompt. Once again, please stop and take a look at it if that's what you want to do, and then the poetry revision prompt. This was the overall design. Um, they were given the initial memory prompt at note taking, then they were given insight and emotional clarity scales, then they were given image generation and poetry revision tasks, and then they were given the emotional insight. So a pre and post scale or a elicitation stage and revision stage. These are the insight scales that were adapted from Grant, Franklin, and Langford. Once again, you can stop and look at them in more detail. 
that I have a clear idea, I understand the experience, I make sense of the experience. These are more cognitive tasks. And then there are emotional clarity scales. I know exactly how I'm feeling about this, then I feel clear about the feelings. And these were adapted from Grants and Roma. And in my previous study, I ran an exploratory factor analysis to make sure that we could combine these into single scores. Now, one of the things that we did here was we analyzed the quality of the poetic image so that we could produce a high, mid and low level of quality because I want to talk about cognitive engagement. High is high cognitive engagement. Uh, we use three criteria, specificity, relatedness and depth of sensory information. All the poetic images were read by two readers. Uh, there was 89% agreement between us, and we use this particular rubric. So for specificity, it's the degree to which the image offers a specific and unique image. And we had a scale from one to three. General was one, specific was three. Relatedness, the degree to which the image represents the experience that's been described. This is where chat GBT really fell flat. Um, loosely related got a one, strongly related got a three. And depth of sensory information, how detailed was the sensory information? One was shallow, three was deep, and, and each um, uh, poetic image was rated on that. And here you have an example of what this means. So this was a high, it got three, three, and three, numbness. She sits on the, on the bottom step, alert, awake, but not able to move. I can only stand by and help where I can. I'm part of the wallpaper. And this was an experience which involved the sudden paralysis of a life partner. Then this was an image, five horses running, um, which was part of describing a growing up in poverty sort of context. So it's relatively specific, but it's very low on sensory. We don't have much information and it was very clearly related. And then we have feeling happy to ride in a car and I love driving. This was an experience about driving alone for the first time. It was related, but it's not very specific and it's not very sensory. So that's how we did the differentiation between high, low and mid, high, mid and low uh, quality of poetic images. Now let's look at some results. Okay, so first off, I just repeated the analysis that I did last time where I compared between the elicitation stage and the revision stage uh, using a non-parametric repeated measures. The data was not normally distributed. And so I used a, a Friedman non-parametric ANOVA. And what we see here is that just as in previous stages, we have very high levels of elicitation for emotional clarity and high levels for in insight, but there's no difference between the elicitation and revision. The revision stage didn't increase or decrease anything here. So this basically replicates the results that we've seen in the previous studies and doesn't provide any evidence on the revision stage doing anything as far as discovery is concerned. I then repeated the same analysis I just showed you, but instead of just doing the whole group, I differentiated between the low quality group, the mid quality group, and the high quality group. So using the rubric I just described, we looked at whether there were differences between the elicitation stage and the revision stage in terms of the pre post results. Um, and this is for emotional clarity. And as you can see, for the low and mid groups, there's absolutely no difference. And in fact, they go down in both cases. But for the high group, uh, whilst it's not significant at 0 0.07, so it's not significant, but I think we can call this a slight trend. And we do see a slight increase. And that's the only situation where we've actually seen an increase between the pre and the post, offering some possibility for revision in relation to emotional clarity and the high quality, and I'll come back to that in at the end of this lecture. Having looked at results for repeated measures, I'd now like to look at differences between the low quality, mid quality, and high quality groups um, in the revision stage. So this directly addresses the research question and addresses the issue of cognitive engagement. Remember, high level cognitive engagement might produce, should produce, high levels and high quality of discovery. And that's actually what we see in this particular set of slides. So in the revision stage, when we're comparing 
low quality to high quality. And if you look over here, this is way down in the emotional clarity in the beginning of the scale, and this is towards the end of the scale. We actually find that there is a significant difference between the low and the high using a Kroskow Wallace um, um, ANOVA, basically. And we see that they are significantly different. And what's different? The low and the high are different, with the high having a much higher score, 5.57 to a 4.55. So at the point of revision, we see a significant difference between high quality and low quality. We also see that same difference actually in the elicitation stage. So this is a difference which started in the elicitation stage, even though uh, this was before they'd actually produced the high quality image. And I'll come back and talk about that in a, a bit at the end of this lecture. Now, um, I also did the same analysis for the insight, um, comparing high, low and quality, and we see absolutely no differences between low quality, mid quality, high quality, either at the elicitation stage or at the revision stage. There were no outcomes which are uh, relevant for insight. Now, Let's look at the second uh, set of questions, which looked at um, uh, cognitive engagement. Is there an association between revision time and emotional clarity? So when we look at revision time and emotional clarity, um, we see that there is a significant relationship. However, it's a negative significant relationship. In other words, the shorter the time they worked, the higher the quality of the poetic image, uh, the higher the quality of emotional clarity that they elicited. The longer they worked, the less clarity they actually had. So this is working in reverse to the hypothesis that cognitive engagement it assumes longer working times. For insight, we see no relationship in relation to revision time and insight. I also looked at the relationship between the total revision time, how long they spent on the revision, and the quality of the output. And there is, once again, a reverse correlation. So the shortest, shorter time they spent working, the higher the quality of the actual image. And this is, once again, quite interesting in terms of the results. OK, so let's let's wind this up and talk about some of the conclusions here. So first, let's address the research questions that I proposed. Are there differences in the degree of insight and emotional clarity for participants who produced high level of poetic image quality, i.e. had higher levels of cognitive engagement? So yes, partly. So higher quality poetic images produce high levels of emotional clarity. Um, however, this was not true for insight. So there's limited support for the relative effort hypothesis. So if they did a better job at the poetic image, they did have high levels of emotional clarity at the end. But this is not true for insight. Is a relationship between the length of revision time and the degree of insight and emotional clarity specified by participants? Uh, yes, there is a relationship, but not in the direction that we thought. So shorter revision times are associated with high levels of emotional clarity. There's no relationship to insight. And shorter revision times are associated with high quality of poetic imagery. Um, this is a limited rejection of the length of exposure hypothesis. OK, but as you remember, my real agenda is where is discovery in the autoethnographic poetry writing process? So in order to explore this, I want to point out a few things. So the first thing I want to point out is there's a cluster of relations. Higher emotional clarity during elicitation, higher quality poetic image, higher emotional clarity in revision, and faster revision time are all correlated. They're all correlated with one another and are significantly correlated. So that we have a cluster of items which are connected. This is not a causal relationship, but there is a clustering that we have here. And we do know for the beginning and ending, for the elicitation and the revision stage, that there is higher emotional clarity for high poetic images. That's not just a correlation, 
that is an ANOVA style comparative analysis. I also want to go back to this, to the differential trends, and I said this in my first results slide. If we look at the slope from the elicitation to the revision for the emotional clarity scale, for the high quality, the green, the high quality, we actually see that the slope goes up. Whereas both for the low quality and the mid quality, I didn't include it here just for clarity of the vision, they both are going down. So if there is any option for any sort of outcome of significance for revision in terms of discovery, it's in relation to the high quality uh, group. So let me end by offering the following interpretation. I think there is the possibility of increased self-discovery in the knowledge transforming process, but only if it is preceded by successful discovery process during the elicitation stage. In other words, rather than thinking of knowledge transforming as a process working by itself, what we see in this particular data is this. We know that knowledge constituting does involve self-discovery. High levels of self-discovery, as we saw a higher level of emotional clarity, improves the revision quality, also makes it faster, which leads to higher levels of emotional clarity and actual increase. So we have a sort of pathway, if you like, where the knowledge constituting process improves the knowledge transforming process, which in itself leads to an increased level of emotional clarity. So this is a more complex set of relations than just the dual model process where each one, the knowledge constituent, knowledge transforming, are developing discovery, but rather there is a relationship between them. And with that, I will end. Thank you for listening. I look forward to your questions and comments and thoughts. And please uh, come to the, the open session where we will be discussing this.